because when you get to know about the different shares, any person gets uh, in accordance with the, the inheritance laws in India. That becomes quite complex. Although it's not, because if you study to read it once, it's not so. But yet, yes, it is a bit lengthy. So I'll, uh, considering the limited scope and uh, limited scope of this present class, I won't be delving into detail as to how property is shared in different inheritance laws. What my basic objective is to ensure that you, as paralegals for the legal aid clinic, know at least which kind of laws govern which area of inheritance and secondly to know how inheritance works in Indian courts because that is something where you will be approached at because how the things are going to be shared is an altogether different matter that is to be decided when the proceedings start in the court but how do you operate a court what is the procedure is something which is very important to be discussed in respect of inheritance laws now First of all, I'd like to ask you a question and uh, that question is very simple but yet very important to begin this lecture. How many of you feel that you are confused about which inheritance laws apply to which community of people in India? If you could just raise your hands in reply to this question. Like how many of you are confused as to which laws apply to which community uh, uh, of people in respect of inheritance in India? So yes, people are generally confused about it. This is because in India, as you all know, there are a host of laws that govern different communities. And that is also a matter of political debate which we need not concern ourselves with. But yes, that is a fact. So that brings me to the first stage of my uh, discourse with you. And that is to disentangle the mass of laws that exist in India in respect to inheritance. Obviously. The major, the basis of this classification is religion, uh, like in a broad sense. Although, if you will pick up any book in the library, even if you pick up Poonam Pradhan Saksena, you will realize that in that book, while talking about the different laws that apply to different people, they have actually talked about how any particular community or a tribe may be governed by a different set of laws. However, that is again beyond the scope of this class because it could take one class to just tell you and not even explain, just tell you as to which kind of laws will be applicable in respect of which community. So, my effort in this class would be to just tell you how broadly things exist in respect of the application of laws to different communities. I think you all must be knowing that in respect of the Hindus, which also includes Buddhist, Jain and Sikh, the law that is relevant for the purpose of inheritance is the Hindu Succession Act. I think you all are aware of this. When it comes to Muslim law, the law is not codified. This is also something very much uh, known in, the, uh, in legal circles and among the law students in this university at least. So what, how do we find the Muslim laws? Obviously through customs or the, not even customs, I think it would be wrong to say customs. There are well identified sources of law in Muslim law. Even though it is not codified in the traditional sense like in, a, in the form of a legislation but still there are well identified sources uh, which you will read about in any treatise on inheritance and those are applicable in respect of uh, uh, Muslims inheritance uh, practice. So where do you find it? I might cite to you the whole list of resources which you might also study in your class, inheritance classes but that's not the point to be made here. I'll give you a practical source. You must have all heard about the All India Muslim Law Board, Person Law Board. It has done a very useful exercise of compiling all the principles made in Muslim law. So you might try to find it on web and then try to ascertain what it. What are the details of that law, which I won't be dealing with. I will be dealing with the general principles of it. Of it. So that is perhaps an introduction to the Muslim. But one important thing about it, as to the fact that is, despite the absence of codified law in relation to Muslim inheritance, there is still a legislative mandate which says that Sharia is applicable to matters of Muslim personal law. And the Act is the Sharia Act of 1937, which says, I have the where act with me, and I'll tell you what it says. It says that in section 2, 
that not the standing any customer usage to the contrary. So it is a non-obstantive loss. It says not the standing anything, any customer usage to the contrary. In all questions regarding interstate succession, because this is something which is pertinent to our discussion today. In relation to interstate succession, uh, the rule of decision in cases where the parties are Muslims shall be the Muslim personal law in bracket Sharia. So Sharia is mentioned in section 2 of the Muslim personal law Sharia application act 1937. So we note it down because this is one of the very few legislations in India that govern Muslim personal law and especially in relation to inheritance. Third now comes to the communities like Christians and uh, Parsis. So in respect of them, which is the law that is applicable in respect of inheritance? So anybody here to guess the answer? Okay, so the law is Indian Succession Act 1924. So even though it does not say specifically whether it applies to Muslim or Hindu, unlike the other legislation that I talked about, the Indian Succession Act 1925 makes special provisions for Parsis in respect of succession and also makes special provisions with respect to Christians in respect of their succession and it's not that the provisions are specially designed for Christians there are many other communities also which I might not be talking about in this class which are covered by the Indian Succession Act of 1925 1925 so that being so like in this way I think I have been able to disentangle the mass of laws that applies to inheritance in India so that is the first help for you when you are sitting in a legal aid clinic so if a person comes, he will know at least which legislation to recommend. Now, I feel it would be apt to tell you how uh, basically this principle of inheritance works in substance. Although I won't be dealing deeply because the kind of shares that are mentioned in different laws, even Hindu law and Muslim law, it's not very easy to deal with even in one semester. But still, I'll be trying to give you just a a bird's eye overview of what it is. So in respect of Hindu law, there are two basically uh, schools of uh, law. That is a Mitakshara school which, is generally, which was generally applicable to the whole of India and the other was Daya Bhaga school which was restricted to Northeast and especially the Bengal. And I think Northeast because I, there is a kind of a uh, unity uh, of unified culture there in, in the East part of the country. So yes, Deva Bhagas was applicable in respect of Hindus in uh, North, North, East and East and in respect of the whole of India it was Mithakshara school. However, the law has been significantly varied through the legislations among which the Hindu Succession Act 1956 is a very uh, known piece of legislation. Uh, also important about Hindu law is that the concept of joint family which we already know more, uh, much about is a very integral part of Hindu law which is not to be found in any other uh, community anywhere in the world. So there you need special laws to deal with this uh, particular concept of joint family. From the concept of joint family comes the most important concept of co-parsonal. Now what is a co-parsonal? A co-parsonal without the amendment which was made through the Hindu Succession Act. Like before the Hindu Succession Act 1996 came into picture. The co-parsonary uh, property uh, was uh, limited to the male members of the family. Up to four generations. So it was like the co parsonary property is something which belongs to the joint family which is not which cannot be said like you cannot say that a, per, a particular person has this much share that share is determined only through partition and pa partition is a different set of process partition enables every member of the joint family to alienate his property as per his own wishes but until that property is not partitioned the co parsonary property remains the property of the joint family which could be shared and enjoyed together but cannot be alienated or cannot like you know alienation is a, as Anirudh was telling you in the previous lecture that alienation is a very important part in re, of uh, in, uh, in transactions of property but in co parsonary property alienation is not possible until partition so that is a very important fact to be known you must have seen the fact that I have said that the co parsonary property belonged only to the males in the family that was a significant loophole I, may, I must say and that was redressed through the Hindu Succession Act 1956 even women were made entitled to the co parsonary property through the Hindu Succession Act uh, the amendment was made in 2005 in the legislation all, uh, uh, the, uh, although the act in the beginning did not address this thing 
but I believe you might, I will suggest you that you check this out also. It was in 2005 that it was uh, seen, it was seen that uh, equality is maintained with respect to um, members of co Parsi and the, the, uh, the rights which are available to uh, men were also made available to women in the family. After co parsonary we come to the plain scheme of the Hindu Succession Act. Uh, the Hindu Succession Act is a very substantive law. It's not procedural or it's very slightly procedural. It talks about two types of succession. One is the inter-state succession and the other is testamentary succession. To simplify these terms, inter-state succession means a person has died without writing a will or without giving an, even a hint of, an, of his intention to the, uh, to, be, uh, to bequest his property in the way he likes. But when a person, when we talk about testamentary succession, we come to know that there is a will which exists through which the person has expressed his clear legal intention as to how his property will be devolved after his death. So that is the crucial difference between interstate state succession and testamentary succession. So the only provision in the Hindu uh, succession act relating testamentary uh, succession is that it says that the will, uh, the property shall be devolved according to a will if there is a will, uh, subject to other laws, subject to other factors or laws that are happening. For example, a person if, he's, uh, if he is, uh, he has a capacity to only give a certain portion of his uh, property to the will, he won't be able to give more of it. So the law only says that the other sub, uh, limitations which are there in any other law uh, or which are there by virtue of any other custom or usage, they are very much applicable. But yes, the legislation does suggest that Hindu Succession Act recognizes the possibility of testamentary succession in the Hindus. So that is the importance of the, the provision written in uh, testamentary succession. However, we know that in uh, many cases, there is, a, there is a very practical possibility of interstate succession. A person may die without expressing his intention as to how the property shall devolve after his death. So what happens is that there the law has field play. There the law can do anything and there the law has done everything. So in uh, the, what they have done is that they have divided the heirs in different categories. They have prioritized different uh, uh, heirs as to how the property shall devolve upon them after the death of the person whose property it is. So there are class 1 heirs, first of all, then there are class 2 heirs, then there are agonates, then there are cognates, and then there are few two more classes. It would not be possible to go deep into as to how these things happen, but the idea was to tell you as to how, th in which sequence a thing will happen. So this is the sequence in which things will happen if a person dies in the of the Hindu succession. Then comes the uh, concept of Muslim law. As I was telling you, the Muslim law is not codified. It's there in various sources, starting from Quran, there's Ijma's, and I'm not able to recount the sources. Hadith, Hadith, Hadith and Hadith, Hadith. 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 Yeah, thank you. So uh, there is a. Could you also tell me the sequence in which they apply? Like Quran is the first thing. Thank you. So these are the four sources on which the Muslim law of inheritance is sourced. And uh, there also, you'll be surprised to know that the principle of inheritance is similar to how the scheme of Hindu succession act works. Yet, yeah, uh, like try to understand what I'm trying to say is that there is again a sequence there also as to on whom the property will devolve if a person dies in these state. So first of all, uh, there is the... Uh, there is a share. There are the sharers first, whose shares are pre-specified, and that uh, that pre-specified share you could look into. You could find on it. Uh, you'll find easily on internet because that table is something which is widely studied. And if you like uh, refer to the All India Muslim Person Law Board's compendium, also you'll find it there as well. So those tables are there. The sharers. The second category is residuaries. The only difference here is that in Hindu law, after the class one. Here's a class 2 heirs terms comes. However, here what it is that the sharers and the residuaries inherit the property simultaneously. And I'll tell you how. This is a, there's a logic behind it. They're called residuaries. The second category is called residuaries. So, ki, jo hai, they get that. So obviously when you have specified shares, simultaneously something will be saved. And that goes to the residuaries. If these both people are, if these two categories of people are not available, then there's a third category called distant kindred. 
or the distant relatives. Then the property devolves upon those people and this is the main scheme of the Muslim law. Then as we saw in Hindu law that uh, uh, that there is the provision for testamentary succession. Similarly, Muslim law also takes care of uh, testamentary succession or succession through a will. There are also varieties of testamentary succession. For example, gift at deathbed, which uh, which is there. Uh, I think it's I don't know it's uh, the, the name, the common name, but it's I think Morte Mars or something like that. I think, but that's not important. You would like to look into it by yourself. So there is gift at deathbed. But then uh, the second thing is that in a will, the capacity to uh, sh like uh, devolve property is very limited. You have to take consent of your uh, other members of the family and the other the other heirs. Sorry, I should not say the members of the family. The other heirs, and uh, also you can't. And that there's a limit, a maximum limit as to how much you can uh, like uh, uh, share a property through a will. That is one third of the uh, property. Only the maximum one third. So, there, but there are slight variations in respect of different schools of uh, Muslim law. Like Shia school prescribes some other, uh, some different procedures. Sunni law prescribes some other procedure. Hanafi law prescribes some other uh, procedures. But yes, the general principle is that one third of the property could be given through a will, not more than that. But then there are some detailed principles that you can look for. So, this is the basic scheme of the Muslim law. Hanafi law, Hanafi law is what the Sunnis basically prefer. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But I think there are slight variations uh, because, uh, like, I, I I talk to one of my friends in my own batch. So there are slight variations in both of them, and those variations you you can know when you are reading about it uh, in it's about the inheritance things. So yeah, but that what you're saying is very true, practically. That uh, in India the Hanafi school is what the Sunnis okay. usually follow. So that's true. So that is uh, the thing about. Uh, the scheme of succession under the Muslim person. Then there is the scheme for succession under Christian law and Parsi law is clearly given in the legislation. What I want to come now is to is how is this substantive law comes into picture through procedure. As to what happens when a person dies in state, how do you approach the court? What happens when a person dies after making a will, how do you approach a court? Uh, so Generally, although the Indian Succession Act does make provisions that certain provisions will apply to Hindus, certain provisions will not, certain provisions will apply to Muslims, certain provisions will not, because again, since Muslim law is uncodified, so uh, there is a different procedural law, for example, sometimes as to how to enforce the bills. But generally, what is the concept of uh, the, the procedure in inheritance law is generally common, and it is uh, basically about three documents or, uh, or three uh, persons who are involved. First of all, uh, there is the concept of a probate. Uh, this is this I am talking to you in the context of will. So, like you are talking about, we are talking about the execution of a will. So, there is a probate when you talk about the execution of a will. And uh, then, if there is a will, we also have letters of administration. Even if there is not a will, there are there are letters of administration. I'll tell you how. Then, thirdly, you also have a succession certificate. If you refer to the law commission's report, you will come to know that they have referred to the succession certificate as a poor man's uh, letters of administration. So I think this is, I don't have any practical experience in giving legal aid as you people will be having in this coming, in the coming years. But I believe that uh, uh, people might just come to you asking for, asking about how succession certificate thing works. So perhaps you might want to know a little bit about succession certificate first. So, but I'll come, but I'll start with the probate thing. A probate is defined in the Indian in uh, Succession Act 1925, it's defined there. What it basically means is that it's a copy of the will that is uh, basically a test, that is basically um, a, a court's authorized copy of a will, which is uh, verified by, by the court of law. And, uh, it's not, the probate is not only that, the probate also consists of the letters of administration with regard to that bill. So, what is the purpose of a probate? The purpose of a probate is to initiate the execution of a will. And, uh, 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 and uh, what happens is that you get a copy of the will and uh, the court grants you the letters of administration and the person in whose favor the letters of administration are granted is usually the executor of the will. 
So that executor will then have to devolve the property or distribute the property in accordance with the intention of the person who has died and uh, that will be done as, uh, as per the will. Secondly, this situation. What happens if the executor of the will declines to execute the will? So in those cases, again the letters of administration come into picture. So here you have a will, but the executor is not willing to execute that. So what will happen is that the letters of administration come into picture again and another person could be given a letter of administration to execute the will. Now he won't be called an, called an executor, but he'll be called an administrator this time. Although the letters of administration are also granted to the executor, but this time the person who was not the original executor of the will will be called the administrator. I hope you are not confused. I think that's... So, uh, this being the case in respect of letters of administration. Yes. I think uh, usually what will happen is that if a person who is not executing a will, uh, a relative might come in his place to like take uh, take up uh, to substitute that person who has refused to execute the will. However, let me tell you, I studied a story once in Hindi, and I think I also narrated to that some of my friends. It was Vasiyada Bhagwati Charan Verma. It is a very funny story. I, I recommend it to you. Uh, <laughs> it's about how a will is executed. It's a very good story. But there I just realized that an executor could also be someone who is not from the family. Because what an executor, executor is someone like a trustee of the property. So it's not necessary that the trustee should be from the family itself. So and it's, all, it's not even necessary that it should be a lawyer. He could be a third person, but he would be applying for it, obviously. Because this is not a public interest matter. Because if, see, see, the thing goes like that. If you study that story, you'll come to know how people are very very excited about how when a person dies and after his uh, death rights are over how when the question comes of reading the will as to how much how much share each person will get then the family becomes very excited they just forget about the person who has died and that's the moral of the story and they go all about it uh, like they're very excited about it so it's like your question is very important because you might you might be thinking that okay if the executor says no then who will come in this place so i assure you that at least in india and 80 percent of the cases People will ensure that if one executor denies, there's someone else to do his job. So I don't think a lawyer will be needed there. And I think that's the... That, it's a Vasiyat. It's a Hindi story by Bhagwati Charan Varma. You will get it or I'll bring it once and I'll upload it on the net. <laughs> it's a very good story. I think that's a story which should be narrated actually in a class and people should listen to it. It's a very good story. Bhagwati Charan Varma. So... Uh, so it's like that. Now uh, that was it. The question is which court of law will have jurisdiction in respect of uh, issuing the let letters of administration of probate. So there are basically two answers to it. Either that could be in respect of the property which is to be devolved. So as you know in CPC, usually the subject matter of a dispute is one where the property is. So the jurisdiction of the court, the, that court will, be, will have jurisdiction where the property, uh, in, in whose area of uh, jurisdiction the property resides. Or the property is not the word reside. However, the second option is that the person who died lastly resided at which place? But which was the last location where he resided? So that is also uh, another uh, basis for jurisdiction uh, for issuing letters of probate, administration or succession certificate. So that being the thing, I now come to succession certificate. Initially when I was reading about succession certificate, I was a little confused. I thought succession certificate was in relation to uh, perhaps when a will was not issued. But then I, when I came to know that, okay, letters of administration are also issued in case of interstate succession. So which means, now this brings me to my next point. So the, uh, when there is no will, how will the uh, property of that person be devolved? Again, you will need a letter of administration. So that is that tells you that a letter of administration is not only required uh, when a will is to be executed, it's also equally uh, applicable in situations where uh, there is interstate succession. That is, the person has died without making a will, without expressing any intention as to how his properties will be devolved. 
So that being the case, we come to succession certificate. Succession certificate, as I told you before, is the poor man's um, elevator. Elevator, it is the Thank you. So why it is called the poor man's elevator? Because it's in re uh, relation to s small debts which are to be paid or which are to be claimed by the heir of the testator. So it's basically a certificate that certifies that okay, the person B died, but this heir of B, that is A, is will be liable to pay the debts of that person or will be the person who will claim the debts that the person had given to someone, that had lent it to someone. So this is particularly the situation in respect of uh, uh, succession certificate. Since it is a thing which is claimed in respect of small debts and all, and even the law commission, why did it say, call it a poor man's LOA, it was because, first of all, it was the law commission's report. So there had to be some recommendations in respect of succession certificate. I have not gone through those recommendations, but certainly they were trying to assert that uh, this is a pra this is an area of law where the procedure could be uh, like Modified. simplified, where unnecessary things could be done away with, so that people who are not so uh, financially able to claim to go for a probate in a court may instead go for a succession certificate. So that being the thing in relation to succession certificate. So I think that was pretty much I wanted to tell you about inheritance. Anybody has any questions to throw up at this point? I think I have been able to tell you things about it. Uh, okay, now so that day I felt that the CRPC lecture was not very enough from the point of view of practical purposes. So today I tried to like uh, tell you something practical as was uh, told to me. So I have brought something with me. Yeah. So we are switching to the CRPC mode again. Uh, but it's, it's still procedure, so it's not something very different from what we discuss in the inheritance. So today, first of all, I talk about FIR. No need to concentrate on the board because there is nothing in respect to FIR. So I will, uh, first of all, you should know if a person approaches you uh, and asks you as to how to file an FIR, there is a simple answer to it which I discussed it with my friends who have some clarity and uh, the answer is that there are three ways to file an FIR the third way is actually the third way does not lead to an FIR it is a complaint but I'll tell you what actually it is the first way is simply to go to a station house officer that is who is a police officer and get your FIR registered it's a first information report term is not used in the civil procedure report However, what you need to understand is that what kind of information do you need to give uh, for, for an FIR to be registered because you know that despite the court's uh, uh, opinions in our country which according to which FIR should never be refused to be registered there are certain practical considerations because the police need to investigate that offence you all know it's a cognizable offence about which an FIR is registered and cognizable means it is a serious offence so, uh, so you need to give in very accurate and very useful information so that the FIR is registered. So if you are advising your client as to what information you have to give, you should know that although there was a list of things which I read on the website, but then I discussed with my friends and they told me that it's better to give only that much of information which is very pertinent in an FIR. So you should be able to tell what incident took place. If you know the name of the accused, if you can identify the accused, you should definitely tell it because that reduces the time for investigation. So that is an information that should be given. Otherwise, if you don't know the name of the accused, that is not a bar, practically speaking also. Then your own name will be there as the informant. Then uh, you have to describe what all things happened there. So it's a kind of, you could also dis uh, discern that from this complaint. See, because the only difference between a complaint and an FIR is that a complaint is filed before a court, that is a magistrate, and a FIR is always filed before a police officer. However, the contents of the situation may not differ. So, if you can see from points 1 to 8, this is a very brief complaint, if you can see. You can understand from here that the address of the complainant is given, and the 